Hi guys, I'm Lauren Smith and I'm studying theoretical physics in Trinity. I'll be taking you through to 2021's higher level question 13. Now, part A of question 13 is directed at those of you who study particle physics, whereas question 13 part B is directed at those of you who study applied electricity. So let's go. Okay, so taking a glance at 13 part A, we are given a snippet of text from a Neil deGrasse Tyson novel all about how particle physics is connected to the formation or the beginning of the universe. Literature bureaus can be useful to gather context in a question like this, but I wouldn't waste time in scrutinizing the text in complete detail, but I just skim over the text briefly just in case. However, the actual long question, if we look at it down here, is broken down into seven parts. Before I dive into part one, I want to revert your attention to page 49 of the Forbian Tables book, which deals with the six different types of quarks, up, down, charm, strange, top, bottom, their charges and their symbols. And in part one, we're asked to state the quark composition of the proton and the answer being up, up, down, which will give you seven marks, if that is fully correct. A trick to remember the quark combination is to look at the charge values of the quarks. A proton has a charge of plus one and it is made up of up and down quarks only. The only possible combination is the one above, as the charge on up quarks is plus two thirds, and we have two up quarks, so it's gonna be, we're gonna need two of them. And the charge on a down quark is minus a third, as shown in the Formian Tables book. And this will give us a total overall charge of plus one. Again, my biggest tip would be to utilize your Formian Tables book to the best of your ability, because you don't know what answers or hints could be hidden in the pages of it. Moving on to part two, we're asked to list the forces experienced by a proton in decreasing order of strength. The forces experienced by a proton, or indeed any particle in the universe, will be subject to the four fundamental forces of nature. The answer, taking into account the decreasing order in strength, which I'm just gonna draw, and make explicitly clear with an arrow here, which I'd probably do in the exam as well, just to make sure what you're trying to convey. We have the strong nuclear force, electromagnetic force, weak nuclear force, and the gravitational force. And to have this in correct order, you get three, and you have four for content or your knowledge of the fundamental forces. The key word though to watch out for is decreasing order. You will lose three marks if the order is incorrect. I would either number them or explicitly label which is the strongest, weakest, etc., so that we have no ambiguity. Or an arrow just down to the right, which I have here, is perfectly fine. Okay, before we move on to part three of the section of our question, I want to draw your attention to page 55 of the Four Main Tables book, where we're going to be looking at the famous mass energy equivalence formula E equals mc squared. For part three, we are told that the Planck constant relates energy and frequency, and its value is 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 34 joules second. And we're to express this unit in terms of meters kilograms and seconds. In order to figure out what this unit is in these SI units, I want to draw your attention to E equals mc squared. Now the energy has the unit of joule, mass, kilogram, and the speed of light has the unit of meters per second, and that's going to be squared. So we can relate quantities to units as I've done here, but we are not looking for the joule, rather the joule second. So we're just going to multiply this formula by the second, or s. It's just going to be like a normal algebraic equation. And all I've done here is multiply both sides by the second. And I've also squared the meters per second part. And we have s squared in the denominator, but we also have an s being multiplied by that. So we can divide through. And therefore, the joule second is equal to kilogram meters squared per second. And this formula will get you seven marks. In part four we're asked to write the nuclear equation for the pair annihilation of a proton and an antiproton. So here is the equation. On the left-hand side, it describes the situation before the two particles collide. As you can see in the diagram, which I've provided to the right, the proton and the antiproton are traveling with equal speeds in opposite directions to one another. Therefore, the total initial momentum of the system is zero, and this is important. Once the two particles collide, they will annihilate, converting all their mass into energy. This energy is the result of the collision and is what you see on the right hand side of the equation. The amount of energy from this conversion is equal to two gamma rays or photons. There are two photons as momentum must be conserved. As the initial momentum was zero, so must the final momentum. To ensure this, two and not one photons were observed and they travel in opposite directions to one another. 
So where do you get your marks? You get two marks for the right hand side of the equation. You get two marks each for mentioning each particle and their charge. Make sure also to differentiate between the proton, which is just a P, and an antiproton, which is a P with a little dash on top. And finally, you attain one mark for the approximate relative molecular mass of the particles. Before moving on to part five, I'd like to draw your attention to a couple of pages in the Four Min Tables book that we're going to use for this section of our question. Firstly, page 46, where we're going to be using the definition and the numerical value of the electron volt and the electron mass. Page 47, where we are going to be using the value of the speed of light in a vacuum. Page 48, where we are going to be using the relative mass of a muon. And finally, like I promised earlier, we're going to be using page 55 of the Foreman Tables book to look at the mass energy equivalence formula, E equals mc squared. On to part five, we are told that a photon produces a muon and an anti-muon pair. Calculate the minimum energy of the photon in electron volt. The last part being extremely important because we are originally going to calculate our answer in joules and then we're going to need to convert it back into electron volts. Here we are looking directly of the conversion of energy of a photon into matter of mu. Naturally, therefore, we shall be using the formula E is equal to mc squared, which yields our first three marks. C is the speed of light, which we know to be roughly, as we saw in the formula in tables book, to be equal to 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. What is the mass? Well, the mass in this equation, which it is referring to, is equal to 2 times the mass of a muon. Now, a particle and its antimatter both have the same mass. So we can calculate the mass of one muon, and if we multiply that by 2, that gives us the total mass of a muon and an antimuon, which is what is created through the photon. And I have denoted m subscript mu to be the mass of a muon, making that explicitly clear to the examiner. And noticing that this is the case, gives us three marks. Okay, so what is the mass of a muon? In the Formian Tables book, it says that the mass of the muon relative to the mass of the electron is 2.07 times 10 to the power of 2, this being the mass of the electron. So it is about 207 times the mass of the electron. So how we calculate the mass of a muon is that we multiply the mass of the electron by this value here. Now, in order to find the total mass, we're going to have to times everything by 2. So we will yield this value because we know that the mass of an electron is roughly 9.11 times 10 to the power of minus 31 kilograms, as we saw in the Formula Tables book. Now, putting this all into our calculator, not forgetting brackets as we're multiplying all of our constants together because we have the scientific notation and the indices there just to make it explicitly clear to the calculator what we want to calculate. And we just hit that equal sign, and this is the mass roughly needed to be calculated, which is roughly 3.77 times 10 to the power of minus 28 kilograms. I'm going to round here when I'm putting my answer down in my solution booklet, but as I'm going to show later, I'm going to try and get the most accurate answer possible, just with a few tricks on the calculator. Now, getting this value of the mass also gives us three marks. Now, again, just having our formula there, and subbing in the correct values for the mass and the speed of light, we can now calculate the minimum energy in joules. So we have the mass up here. It's this kind of more long-winded decimal number than what we have written down in our solution sheet. But this answer is stored in the calculator as answer. Remembering that the speed of light is squared, and don't forget your brackets, we have the value of the energy here. And this value is roughly 3.39 times 10 to the power of minus 11 joules not forgetting your units, you will lose marks, even though we need to convert those joules into electron volts. This answer will give you your next three marks. To get your final two marks, we need to convert it into electron volts. Now we know from the formula in tables book that one electron volt is equal to 1.602 times 10 to the power of minus 19 joules. So therefore, to convert our answer into electron volts, we need to divide through by this value. Putting this into our calculator now, again, this answer for the energy is going to be stored as answer, so we don't need to re-input it into the calculator. Being very careful with your scientific notation and indices, press that equal sign, and this is going to give us roughly 2.12 times 10 to the power of 8 electron volts. It is a very good idea to convert it into scientific notation. It makes your answers easier to understand and more compact. It's a good um, 
practice in science and this answer will get you your final two marks. Okay, so moving on to part six, we are asked that how are particles accelerated and maintained in circular motion in the Large Hadron Collider? For part A, explaining how particles are accelerated, they can be either accelerated by the voltage or the electric field or the magnetic field. Electric fields accelerate particles to a high speeds and magnetic fields supply a centripetal force which accelerates the particles by changing the direction of their motion. Now this centripetal force caused by the magnetic field, as you can see in part B, maintains the circular motion. This is due to the nature of a magnetic field. If you think back to the formula of the force caused by a magnetic field on a particle, particularly a charged particle. For your first correct answer, you'll get four marks. And for your next correct answer, you'll get three marks, giving a total of seven. For the final part, part seven, we're told that in 1932, Walton and Cockroft manufactured one of the first useful particle accelerators. Now we are asked to state two reasons why their experiments using the accelerator were of scientific significance. NB, this is a very, very famous experiment and pay attention and know the background experiment and conclusions of it because the examiners love asking about this topic as Walton, Ernest Walton, was an, in fact an Irish physicist and an alumni of Trinity College Dublin. So they love to incorporate that in the Leaving Sear course. Okay, so the two reasons are that it was the first experimental verification of E equals mc squared. This is the big one. It verified Einstein's energy and matter conversion for the first time and that they can be converted from one to another. And it also was the first transmutation of artificially accelerated particles, i.e. the first artificial splitting of the nucleus as well. The marks again, like the previous question, part six, are broken down into four and three. Four marks for your first correct answer, three marks for your next correct answer. Okay, so here's the first look at question 13, part B, all about applied electricity. And if you read the following passage, you're going to find a little bit about how the transistor was first born in 1947. And this is a little bit of fluff here, but it does give context to the questions that we need to answer, which if you scroll down here, you can see that it splits the question itself into seven different parts. So let's begin. In part one, we're asked to explain how a photodiode works. So in the first part of our answer, we need to say that a photodiode is a PN junction in reverse bias. And I've put reverse bias in bold writing because this is an incredibly important concept behind the operation of a photodiode. Reverse bias means a configuration like I have set up here to the right. So we have a diode, this PN junction here where we have the p-terminal containing holes and the n-terminal containing electrons. And we have a pure charge built up here called the depletion layer. Reverse bias is such that the negative terminal of the battery is connected to the p-terminal, i.e. we have p and negative, and we have the positive terminal of the power source or the battery is connected to the n-junction. The electrons in the n-junction are attracted to the positive terminal, as you can see here, so they're going to want to go around this way. And the same thing can be said for the holes in the P layer. They are The positive holes are going to be attracted to, to the negative terminal of the battery. And this widens the depletion layer. So we're just going to get a pure charge build up throughout the PN junction. And therefore, no current can flow. It's going to block all the current. However, in a photodiode, we have light shining down. We have, see, our, my drawing skills aren't the best. But we have uh, light rays shining down on the photodiode. And this creates an electron hole pair. So we have an electron in the depletion layer and we have a hole here. This basically means that an electron obtains energy from the incident light and thus it is kicked out from this bond it has with the hole in order to become a free electron and this hole is left behind. But if this is done in the depletion layer, what will happen is the electron will be accelerated towards the positive end of the battery 
treat just like all of the electrons in the um, N junction and in the same way the positive hole will be attracted to the negative terminal of the battery. Therefore this depletion layer actually decreases and this causes a current and the current will flow towards the negative terminal of the battery and away from the positive terminal of the battery like so. And I've written that in words here just highlighting the important bits. Now each of these three points you'll get three marks for saying that the PN junction is in reverse bias, two marks for saying that it creates electron hole pairs in the depletion layer and your final two marks will be attained when you say the diode conducts current when light shines on the junction. In part two we are told that diodes can be used to make a bridge rectifier and we're to draw a circuit diagram of a bridge rectifier. So here for your full marks you need a correct arrangement which is shown over here and that will get you your three marks and your other four marks which will be the most important is to showcase that we have four diodes in this bridge network circuit. So we have our bridge network here and we also have a resistor and of course we're going to have the AC power source and if this configuration is shown correctly you're going to get your full seven marks. In part three we are asked to sketch the input and the output voltage patterns for a bridge rectifier. Okay, so in the first diagram here, we have voltage versus time plotted. And in the second diagram here, we also have voltage versus time plotted. And that will get you your first three marks for those correct labelings of the axes. Now, explaining the shape of the first curve, we know that in a bridge rectifier, the same as we saw in part two, it has an alternating current or AC input. So it has a AC input voltage source. Therefore, the voltage is both sinusoidal in form and unidirectional, which is drawn here. It's shown in the diagram here that this input voltage is unidirectional as the voltage can be both positive, like we have here, here and here. But it also can be negative, like down here, here and here stating that your input voltage is an AC source will get you another two marks. Now for your output voltage, the bridge rectifier does respond to an AC signal and it's changing polarities as follows. So in the first positive half cycle of the AC signal, two out of the four diodes become forward biased and start conducting. Then at the negative half cycle, the other two diodes become forward biased and therefore start conducting current. In both half cycles, the output voltage of the resistor only has one direction as shown in the diagram here because the output voltage is always in the positive sense of the diagram i.e all of these curves as you can see here indicate a positive output voltage and therefore because it only has one direction it must be direct current which yields you two marks okay so moving on to part four now we're asked to draw the structure of a bipolar transistor and here I've drawn not only the circuit symbol, which will be useful for part five, but I've also drawn the actual diagram for it. OK, so basically we have a lightly doped piece of P type semiconductor, which we call the base here. It's and it's sandwiched between two other thicker, more heavily doped N type pieces called the collector, which I've just highlighted there, and of course the emitter. And three, the three are formed more or less on one crystal of semiconductor material. Now these three connections I've drawn are all connected to a transistor here, i.e. here, here, and also here, okay? And we have three components, so we have three sets of marks. Your first correct component will get you three marks. And for the remaining two correct components, you will get two marks and another two marks. So in part four, we looked at an NPM bipolar transistor. Now, how do we use this in practice? Um, what are the applications for it? And we can see this clearly in part five, where we're asked to draw a circuit diagram of a voltage amplifier to indicate clearly both the input and the output voltages. So what is a voltage amplifier? A voltage amplifier is a circuit in which a small change in the voltage across its input causes a corresponding larger change in the value of the voltage across its output. So we have our input voltage here, which I've indicated over there, and we have got a positive terminal over here and a negative terminal over here, indicating that in this region here, it has a higher potential than this region down here. Now we have the bias resistor up here, that's one of the main components. 
and to show that that is in correct position will get you two marks. Now to indicate that the input voltage is in the correct position we need to have it between the base and the emitter. That will get you three marks and we have the base here. I'm just going to label it as B and we have the emitter down here. I'm going to label that as E and the collector up here as C. And these three components, as we saw in part four, all give way to the NPM bipolar transistor. The transistor itself, it's, if it's included in the diagram, will get three marks. And we have that the load resistor is up here and that the output voltage is between this part here, just where the collector is, and just at the top of the circuit here. So that's the output voltage and that's across the load resistor that will get you three marks. Also indicating a power source will get you three marks. In part six, it asks us what the function of a load resistor and a bias resistor is in a voltage amplifier. Okay, so in part A for the load resistor, the load resistor simply converts a change in collector current to a large output voltage. The collector current is the current which comes from the collector of the transistor. The output voltage is then taken across the collector and the load resistor. For part B, the bias resistor simply ensures the base emitter junction is forward bias. For your first correct definition, you'll get four marks. And for your second correct definition, you'll get your next three marks. On to our final part of our question. We're going to be looking at part seven and we're still banging on about this transistor and we're told that it can be used in a circuit to act as a knock gate. So we're asked what is the name of the circuit and we're also asked to draw what's called a truth table for this knock gate. A uh, NOT gate is one of the three logic gates which you study in Leaving Cert Applied Electricity. And a logic gate itself is an electronic circuit that has an input and an output. And this output voltage depends on the input voltage in a definite manner. You're going to have different types for the AND or OR NOT gate. We're, we're asked in particular the NOT gate. And basically, if we have a certain input voltage, it's going to directly affect the output voltage in a drastic way. And I'm going to explain the table before I say what the name of the circuit is. So it's a NOT gate. So if we have, say, a high voltage input here, I'm going to call one the high because that's the highest number out of our ones and zeros. So say if that's high because it's a NOT gate, we're going to have the opposite. So we're going to have the output voltage as something called NOT high or it's going to be low. Low is the opposite of high or NOT high. Hint, 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 NOT, NOT gate. That kind of helps you remember it. And this is the same logic as for if we say had a low input, our output is going to be NOT low i.e. high. This is going to be the direct opposite. In circuits of this kind, we're only really going to be comparing high and low input and output voltages. There isn't really a medium or anything like that. So we're just going to think high, low. So it's always going to be the opposite. And basically because we have the opposite output voltage to the input voltage, the voltage in its sense is inverted and therefore we call it a voltage inverter. Now the marks given for this question are voltage inverter. We get three marks. And for this correct row of the truth table, we're going to get two. And we're also going to get two for our next correct row on the truth table. And that is the end of our question.